First of all, welcome everyone. Welcome PJ. Really great to have you on the webinar this week. Thank you very much for offering your time and your insight. I'm Adam Walker. I manage product marketing at CanDo. And every other week we have a interview with wonderful and interesting people from the SaaS ecosystem, ranging from topics in growth and customer education. This is my colleague, Georgia, who's going to introduce herself. Hey there, I'm Georgia. I'm the head of customer here at CanDo. So helping people basically run the gamut from getting to start to CanDo to building live components. And yeah, have been a part of this webinar series. I'm super excited to hear from PJ and, and learn a little bit more from you today. Very cool. PJ, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure thing. PJ Bruno here, Director of Customer and Partner Education at Braze, which is customer engagement platform for those of you who do not know. Yeah, and I've been there for about four years. I've been in the SaaS education game for about 15 years. Started a little company called Grovo. Oh, yeah, from back in the day. Started a company called Grovo with a group of friends when I was like 23. Did that for six years until it got acquired by Cornerstone, which was pretty rad. Very Took a year off of tech just to become a yoga teacher and did yoga, pure yoga NYC. Did that nice. for like a year. And then I got back into the tech game in uh, 2017 and I've just been loving the ride. I got to be honest with you. Awesome. I'm glad you got back on the horse. That's right. It was time. It was time. The, the horse showed up. And so I really just got on. I love that. So yeah, tell us about what customer education maybe was like at Braze, because I understand things have changed dramatically in the last couple of years. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So when I started in 2017, November, I was a team of one, just hired as customer education manager, writing scripts, doing research, running around to subject matter experts of the company to really understand the product and the, the best in class use of it. Video editing, audio production, I launched a Braze podcast that lived for about a year and a half. It's on ice now, but it will make a comeback. And then, yeah. Really, I was just focused on the, the self-serve content. Basically, when I was hired, I was brought into the growth department. I know different growth departments are focused on different things. Some growth departments are solely focused on revenue and how do we grow that. Ours was like, how do we create better users and more loyalty and like really tick up that renewal rate? So it was also really nice to be right next to the uh, BI team because we had access to so much data. So that was fantastic. But yeah, the idea was like, how do we scale the customer success team by having the right self-serve content for customers to dip into and educate themselves? And I was doing that on my own for the first, I want to say eight or nine months, put out a, some, some like seven to 10 courses. And then I got the kind of runway to hire the first folks on my team, instructional designer, content producer. And then over time, you know, in 2020, we started adding instructor-led training to that. It was the right time for a number of reasons. Mostly we realized that a SaaS product, especially one that's uh, as robust as ours, it can be complicated if you don't have the right person walking you through it and don't feel like you're experiencing it in more of a safeguarded environment. So it made sense for us to uh, think about instructor-led training at that point. But yeah, asynchronous is really, I think it's the way that you got to start. If you're a young customer education professional and you're thinking about, hey, where, where do I begin? You got to think about the things that scale. You got to think about those self-serve resources. What can be asynchronous? Right. You can create a path for it, all this stuff. Do you have the right assessments in place and bits of quizzing? But I think another piece of the puzzle is for all you young customer education managers out there, understand what the onboarding process looks like. Understand what the kickoff is and when that happens and make sure all those stakeholders, whether it be an onboarding manager or a success manager, understands when they need to be talking about your products and when they need to tee it up because they need to understand not only does it help you out when they tee up your content, but it helps them out too. And I think I'll get into this a little bit. You can't expect a, an onboarding manager or a success manager to spin all the plates all the time. And that's how the education team should position itself. It's not here to replace your job. No one's going to replace you. It's here to supercharge your presence basically and give you more education support. Yeah. I think Georgia can relate to that. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. We both are thinking about our self-serve model. And also I think so much about thinking about self-serve is thinking about how it impacts current customers. And a lot of what we talk about is actually that 
n plus one concept of you spend a ton of time in customer success on the first user who's setting up the account and becomes your champion. But there's a lot of other users, hopefully, that come on board in an organization. And as a customer success manager, you're not necessarily going to get to talk to all of them. And how do you think about making sure that those people have a good experience when they're not the first person that you've spoken with, or you don't even know their email necessarily, um, especially yeah. a larger organization. So trying to figure out how to sort of couple those two things. So everyone has a good experience is, is. And it's gotta be, it's gotta be a really tactful dance that you do because no customer wants to receive an email. That's just like a bunch of links and go figure that out. And we'll talk soon. So it's gotta be the right kind of touch that shows that you're in there. You have that first meeting or that kickoff. Jessica, thanks so much. Like, I think we did so much here. Really excited for our call next Thursday. But before that happens, can you just check out these two to three courses? It's gonna give you that really strong foundational understanding so that next week when we meet, we can really like have a more sophisticated bespoke conversation about your use cases rather than me just explaining what this little button does. And so basically you're act asking them to come to the table more. You're asking them to take an active role in their own development, which I think, I think is crucial. It's crucial to get right. I mentioned to Adam uh, earlier this week, it's gotta be a little Jedi mind trick. So you gotta show that you're there for them, show that you're present. If you're not doing the give and take and directing them to the right resources with the right kind of touch, you could end up in a situation with a customer that is just entirely leaned back, forcing you to take all of the action, every meeting asking, what are you doing for me? And success managers or onboarding managers, they'll fall into that pitfall of doing all of it. They'll end up doing it all because oftentimes if you're at a tech startup and you're a success manager, probably it's going to say something about being in your DNA to go above and beyond all the time. It's who we are. Our people are our best attributes. So we always go above and beyond. And that's a great sentiment, but if you're a startup and you're getting to be around like 800, 900, 1,000 people, you're actually over-servicing customers and you're actually doing more damage to the company. And that's what the education manager, I think, needs to do to have those conversations with the success team. Because at some point, there's going to be like a microscope over every second a CSM spends with a customer. Because there's a cost associated with every second you spend with a customer. How do you maximize that time? It's education. It's putting them on the right path. It's giving them the right things to aim for. And it's also certification. Shout out to Nia Boburn. She's on the call. She's global director of certification at Braze. Thanks for joining. Oh, great. I had yeah. two things I wanted to dig into there. Yeah. I think that's very, all very important. And one is a fine line between, especially as customer success, just, I think we think about this a lot of just like taking up your customer's time and making sure that every interaction is really valuable for them. So that they actually get on the call with you every week, getting a weekly meeting on people's calendar is hard. And so making sure that they know why they're coming is really important, but also, especially in the pandemic world, people are excited to learn new things. They want to go above and beyond in their jobs. They want to have a good time. And if you do tread that fine line, you can be part of helping people do more with their jobs and be more excited. And if you don't tread that fine line, then you're just like another meeting on their calendar. So figuring out how to be able to do that. I'm teaching you how to do something. I'm making you better at your job yeah. without it feeling like you're just taking up their time and asking them to watch a bunch of videos, like making it really right. relevant to them. Exactly. And that understand that you have more leverage than you think you do. And like almost setting like prerequisites for the next call. This is what you should do to put us in a much better position to have this conversation. And I, and again, like I come back to the Jedi mind trick thing. I feel like learning can be scary sometimes with new tools, but when someone actually is pushed to do it and they learn it and they've done it, there's like a little thrill there. I said it to Adam earlier and I, I don't. It feels like a marketing phrase, but we don't go to market with this, but you just need to find a way to spark the seeker within the customer because there is that habitual learner inside us that's hungry for more learning. Sometimes we, we quiet it, we put it to the side, or we just feel like we're actually scared by new stuff. But once you do the thing and you've done it, there's actually a feeling of accomplishment. There's a feeling of activation. And so how do you have the right kind of cocktail of human touch points, self-standing interactive modules? to get someone in that active kind of lean in space. Yeah. And I'm curious if you have ideas about this, because I think on the one hand, you hear about MOOCs or those massive online learning courses where the big problem is that people just, they start them because they're excited about learning, but they don't always finish them because 
there's not a dry life is busy things come up. And so how do you use the personal touch to make sure that they actually do get through the course? And then on the flip side, how do you set up the courses so that people are having that constant sort of spark of, oh, I'm doing okay. I'm doing a good job. I'm getting through this to keep them motivated, to keep moving forward. Yeah. Those moments of like affirmation. And I think it does come with that human touch, but to me, this is why certification is, is such an important thing. I, I feel like I, I sound like a broken record, but for the, those folks who don't know it, training is for folks who need to be educated. Certification is when you're ready. You have the proficiency, you feel confident in your skills. You want to prove it and you want to earn a badge. Sometimes just the learning outcome or just having learned something is not incentive enough to continue down this path of whatever, a two hour, three hour self-serve course. Like at some point you're going to run out of steam, but the idea of a credential that has like clear earning criteria of what you're capable of doing that actually, I think it's more valuable today than it ever has been. And I often compare it to a college bachelor's diploma where even an Ivy league school like Harvard, if you have a Harvard diploma, that's cool. I still don't know what you can do. And what you can bring to the table versus a SAS certification with very clear earning criteria. Like I know for a fact that when I bring you in, you're going to be able to do X, Y, and Z. So I know the places where I need to train and certification is not gamification really, but it does put a game element into it because it shows someone a gold star that they want to get. And, and eventually it picks up its own steam. And that's what I loved about our certification program when we launched it was seeing the organic marketing in LinkedIn from people getting that badge, showing it off, taking so much pride in it. And it just becomes like a mm. snowball effect. And there's definitely a certain- I remember seeing of... this in my LinkedIn when bringing oh, certification. Yeah. I just remember suddenly seeing a lot of people posting about having gotten yeah. the certification in Brace. They're proud nice. of it and we're proud of them as well. And it, it's something to take pride in, but, but yeah, it definitely, it creates action. And there are those types of people that when in the Boy Scouts or the Brownies or once you get the one badge, like you don't want an empty sash. You want to make sure you fill that stuff up. And it's like Pokemon collectors. You just got to catch them. I like yeah, I, I live in metaphors, unfortunately. It's quite <laughs> confusing. So we're talking about the organic marketing of these certification courses. But when you were first rolling out certification and, and the education resources too, was it all personal touch of getting that into people's inboxes or going after champions? Like, how did you think about getting more and more of your users to get really engaged with that kind of content? Yeah, that's probably like the hardest part. It feels like it's one of the hardest parts of my job today. You can create a beautiful email that gets triggered at the right time and goes to a customer and they see it, but they are inundated with emails all day. So like your best bet is make champions out of those people who go to market, who are customer facing. So it was all about having very regular go to market enablement sessions for sales folks, for success managers, for onboarding managers, making sure they understand the value of it and can speak to it. And then I think if you get it in the right people's hands, you, you'll soon find like you have that one sale. And you person. drove this PJ. What's that? Say that again. You drove this initiative. This was your baby. It was within my team. I hired someone specifically to run it who had like cool. candidly 10, 15 years more experience than I did specifically in certification. Yeah. Certification is a very specific industry uh, and there's a lot that goes mm -hmm. into it, but all, effectively the person reported it to me. So I had a lot of oversight and because this person was new, I knew that I could do best to activate things was that person to person activation, rallying the right stakeholders, not just shouting out loud, Hey, it's a new thing. And it's cool. Showing whatever data I had at my fingertips to make it a compelling argument that Hey, this is not just good for the customer. It's good for you. It's good for Braze. It's good for the brand and doing whatever you can to make advocates of those people. So yeah, do what you can to automate. Like obviously a big email campaign celebration is great. If you can shout it out at some other publication, if you have like a communications team that can get you on one or two other blogs to shout it out, that's always great. But yeah, in, in any research I've seen around getting customers to be activated with education resources nothing beats a person teeing it up. So is that, as long as those yeah. teams understand the value of what you do, the right time and moment to talk about it, I think more importantly, getting them to understand that it's a piece of what we're all doing. It's not just something that's over there. How do you embed it within the conversation and the flow of their relationship with Braves? And that's something that candidly, like I can, and we can do a much better job of is like having it feel connected and fluid and not just some fragmented thing of, I have this relationship with an onboarding manager, and then I received this email about a webinar, yeah. but
but True. the onboarding manager didn't mention it. So do they know what's this? How does it mm. feel like everything's informed? It's, it's omni-channel communication, making it consistent across right. channels. If I could only plug like individual stakeholders into my multi-channel onboarding flow and have them be a part of that, of that <laughs> mapping. Right. We're not there yet, but at some point when we get the chips back here, yeah, we'll, we'll be cool. Yeah. And it's also the flip side is that every onboarding is a little, as much as we try to streamline things and make things work the same way each time, yeah. every organization you're working with is going to be unique. They're going to have a slightly different process that you end up going through with them. So figuring out really how to deeply embed the knowledge of how this all fits in so that you can improvise a little bit and still have it feel like a consistent process. But also the nature of SaaS is like process is always changing the product is always changing. The materials always need updating. So that is just, mm -hmm. I, I hesitate to call it a wrinkle because it is such a massive thing that complicates the whole communication process of making this like a really nice, slow and steady and connected experience. I, I just wanted to highlight one thing. PJ and I were chatting earlier, Georgia, and this point about compliance with education, it's people are, uh, or it's more effective to have an existing relationship with the customer success manager, who's the one who's, as you said, teeing up the person to say like, why don't you go through this course or watch this video prep for 30 minutes before our next call. And I think what in under normal circumstances, I would think, oh, this strategy wouldn't be relevant for maybe smaller SaaS products where the average customer value would be much lower and you wouldn't have that kind of one-to-one -one touch points as frequently. But then I thought about an example of superhuman, right? Which is the email client that is $30 a month. I, I say it in an ironic way, but I pay for it. And as part of superhuman's onboarding, they make it mandatory to go through a like a 10 minute educational session one-on-one -on -one with somebody from their team. Now, under normal SaaS metrics, you couldn't justify spending 10 minutes for every person that you're onboarding. But I think that appears to be the way, at least in the beginning, for sure, to be able to drive compliance. Yeah, I think, and I mean- so more, I think more successful users. And I think a lot of companies are, are understanding that and getting that no matter how complex or simple the tool is, having that first touch point with a human, it sets the whole stage. And it's, I don't even think that Braze has companies join us without an onboarding. There sure, there are lighter touch ones and more intense ones, but you need to have, that's crucial for the sake of the customers finding success. Yeah. And I think also just being really prescriptive, like that's one thing that had I been able to do it over again, I would have done it differently because with our tool, there's actually not one single way to do it and not one single place to start from necessarily. So I think when I was developing the content, I just thought of the most important topics, putting them first and foremost, and then having it almost like an a la carte experience. Hey, what do you need? The truth is People want to be told what to do. People want to be told where to start, where to go, where do I finish? When do I talk to you? So being prescriptive and like giving strong, because they're learning something new already. They feel like, I don't really know what's going on. So if you dump them into an LMS that just has no sense of, of this pathing and where to start and where to end up, then it just, it doesn't cause you to lean in. It doesn't cause you to take action. It causes you to flounder a little bit and maybe put yourself in, in the seat to the driver's seat of educating yourself. But more often than not, when like, it's a really easy way to understand the starting point, the midpoint, the assessment checkpoint, the touch point with the, the customer facing person, it's just so much easier. And that's, uh, yeah, that's something that we're doing a lot more thinking about and investing our time. In. I was actually reading a study recently that when asked what people thought made a great customer success um, manager, like everyone said, oh, yeah, sorry, oh, sorry. everyone said like high degrees of empathy and an ability to relate to the client and ability to be flexible. And then they talked to clients about their best experience with customer success. And they all said this personality type of being really prescriptive and directive and telling you what to do is actually what people liked working with best mm. because we want to make these horizontal products that, that help everybody. But it turns out when you're getting started with something, being given the entire like cheesecake factory menu is really overwhelming. And oh, yeah. you would much rather just have someone be like, this is the best thing we have. Let's go with that. And then we can figure it out from there. And we, I think we got into a situation like that as well. Like I won't speak to what it is where we have a, a CSM that the attitude is much more just showing up. Hey, 
what's up? What do you need? Just say, hey, like you, you got a nice smile on your face and that's cool, but tell us what's up. Tell us what to do. Like you understand what's happening with our instance. You mm. understand data that's coming through. Can you make recommendations based on that and are like on a, at a regular clip? And yeah, I think that's really good feedback for any success org is be prescriptive, show them the way, because there's already this element in their head of like lack of clarity around the tool and how to connect the use of the tool to their goals. To add to that, some lack of clarity around what the next steps are and where to go. Jeez, like you're just putting someone in the deep end without teaching them how to swim. Sorry, metaphors. Ugh, where does... All right, I'm done. Ah, I'm never going to diners again. PJ, you had a graphic <laughs> that showed how you align the content with the user journey. Is that something you could share? I think that'd be really helpful for everyone. And I, I, what I found quite interesting was like, this was pretty organic. It's my understanding of like how you started to insert content into the user journey. It was a lot based on observation. Yeah, it was just really, like I said, getting tight with the onboarding or the success team and understanding the things that they're doing and the touch points of there and coming to them with a solution for how to improve those conversations. This is a rough example. And the truth is, is like things have changed since this was created. So this isn't even like super up to date, but the idea is how do you actually do the research and understand what the process looks like today and mm -hmm. like when exactly you would need to drop in the right self-serve education to improve those conversations. So the, the sell to the person is, man, do you think that data planning review session, like it's usually spent answering a lot of day one questions and not getting done what you hope to get done. And so the idea is like maximize the time there to talk about the right things and actually set up the expectation that these things need to be done. And that's the thing is like coming back to being prescriptive. I would even go as far to say, don't make it a suggestion. Don't make it an optional reading. Make it legit and needed for someone to actually do this. And coming back to here, and this is this is an example of the, the need for the trainer, the instructor-led trainer. And obviously we started with self-serve. We eventually got to a place where we brought in trainers. And the pitch to the onboarding team and the success team is like, first of all, they're the most taxed, I think, individual contributors to the company. They're constantly asked to go above and beyond and they do it time and time again. And the situation that Taylor or Pooja will find themselves in is they have to wear a training hat too sometimes because they need to educate here and there. But what will happen is they'll get down a pitfall of training all the time and only doing that where they talk to someone who's like, hey, Taylor, thanks so much for that session. That was awesome. Can you lead the same session with our team in Tel Aviv? And then the same session with our team in Berlin. Oh, you know what? We have a team in APAC as well. And so you end up being this person who's just running around doing training. It's not a good use of Taylor's time when you could be mm -hmm. leaning on a trainer who their whole competency is training and adult learning. And this is what they do and they have a passion for. So not only are you leaning on someone who actually has the competency to deliver on what's promised, you're making more time in these other stakeholders days. So that's the way that I tee it up for them is lean on us. Let us take this piece of the puzzle out so you can focus on relationship project management, on being like more of a bespoke consultative resource. And that way the customer can go to a training, learn a bunch of stuff, and then come back with ideas like breadcrumbs for what excellence should look like and say, you know what, Taylor, I saw a pretty in interesting use case in that session with Tommy, I wonder if we can to use for ourselves. And then you have a more educated user. You have someone who's coming to the table with ideas. They're leaning in now. They're taking an active role. They're not sitting in the back seat expecting Taylor to run every conversation. Very cool. So I don't... I think Georgia can relate to being a customer success manager and, and constantly educating users. Sorry. I'm trying to stop my sharing. Okay. Anyways... <laughs> this was, uh, there you go. And uh, onboarding managers appreciate it too. This is just an example of a Slack that I got from Pooja, who was just like, not just thankful for a good customer experience, but thankful that it created more time in her day. Like yeah. customer success. And exactly. And they, the left hand has to know what the right hand is doing. I think making sure that when you do hire an education person, that's the one thing that I've seen elsewhere that I, I really like this idea. Like I said, I am in the growth department. That's where I started. That's where my team lives. But now the challenges of today are not the challenges of yesterday, where, for example, 
when I was a team of one and it was 150 people, I could just run around to different experts, get their expertise, throw 30 minutes on, pick their brain. Cool. I have an outline versus now, like I said, every second of someone's time is accounted for and overseen. So it's like pulling teeth. If I want subject matter expertise from the success team or the onboarding team, I need to get to their directors like a month before the quarter starts, get it on their radar, make sure I'm getting their time the right way. So it's a different battle we fight today than yesterday, but I have seen customer education teams like sprout within the customer success department or the onboarding department. I think that is very cool because then you produce content and pathing with always in mind what the onboarding process is rather than it becoming like an afterthought or something. You're actually building right next to and alongside those folks who have the map of here's what the first three to six months looks like. Now you can map to this in a more, I can get that map, even if I'm just in the growth department, but it's not as in tune. It's not as plugged in. There's not that same level of awareness of, okay, I, I had my second meeting. They're going to go take these modules. And then I have my fourth. Okay, good. Got it. But so there's a different level of awareness when it's within your own department. Yeah. And I was curious about when you were showing the slide before, it looks like you bring in a trainer to do not just like video training, but also personalized training for these teams. And then you have a team on your side who can sync together and talk about use cases and get deeper just by having more eyes on a client. Yeah. How do you think about the interaction between, I guess you were just getting into this a little bit, but between education and customer success, obviously you're learning about their processes, but you're also able to teach them things about how to better onboard clients and strategize. Like how do you guys yeah. interact together to try and create a better experience? Well, they definitely help create and vet the content in the training sessions because success managers, they have seen the most sophisticated use of our tool. But I think an interesting give and take of it is in our training sessions that Tommy leads, they're one to many. So versus Taylor, every conversation she has, it's to a single client. It's with their goals in mind. It's always through that lens versus Tommy. Yes, Tommy's bringing like the best in class use cases to the table, but he's talking to multiple brands at once. Like he's in a class with like 10 to 15 people, potentially all from different companies. So what that does, it changes the relationship. But yes, Tommy is there for you, but he's also there for this person and that. Way. So it's a different relationship. It's not someone who's at your beck and call like a CSM. It's actually a teacher that you want to show up and, and listen to and respect and learn from. So it's not like, it's just a remarkably different relationship than a CSM. You start to treat this person like they're doing all the things and versus Tommy, like you want to show up and you want to listen and you want to learn from, but you don't say to Tommy, Oh, that's cool. Can we schedule some time for you to walk my whole team through that? You wouldn't do that to Tommy. So it actually, it sets the tone. It sets the tone for the customer to take that active role versus just asking people to do stuff for them. These are real people, Tommy. Tommy's a real person. Tommy's not cool. made up. Tommy is flesh Check and blood. Check. Cool. Yeah, no, those were, those were computer gener generated images of humans. Those aren't real people. <laughs> PJ, I thought we could do a little intermission now for the audience and we're trying out to mix it up to have some fun during these webinars is I started introducing some trivia and I've created a poll that Georgia has access to and don't start it yet, Georgia, but the context is for everyone in the audience and there's folks who are live streaming. So next time you should join inside the Zoom link so you can participate. We will have three questions. And if you get two out of three correct, you will win a Amazon gift card for $10. So this is open-ended to anybody who gets two out of three correct. Georgia, could you open up the questions? Okay, I've never done customer education for Zoom. So if I get this wrong, just know that it's, because I haven't had a full ex just education experience. Isn't that what I'm supposed to do? It should be open now. Oh, I hit launch. Here we go. The buttons make it obvious. Ah. Okay, I know. There we go. Okay, great. So, Product. oh gosh, we can't vote, but the folks in the audience can vote. So let's give it, you've got one minute to answer these three questions. And then PJ, I don't know if you have the email open. I sent you, uh, oh. but you can tell us what the answers are. Let's Make see. this interactive, but don't answer Is it yet. Is trivia a usual part of your customer education sessions or customer success sessions? Is trivia a usual part? <laughs> Not exactly. Typically. I wouldn't say exactly. Maybe quizzing, but trivia. Yeah, trivia less so. Less of a trivia night, more of a targeted learning experience. 
Okay. I have the answer. So you let me know when you need to activate me. Do we have any answers in from the audience? All right, good. We've got another, I don't know. Actually, I was <laughs> not looking at the seconds, but I don't know, 20 seconds. You guys should guess too. I can't. Say. You have the answers, PJ. So I love that there's a little like blurb after each answer too. I can do a little electron. Exactly. Yeah, I thought it'd be fun. All right. Should we close the poll? Let's see how the audience does. All right, PJ, why don't you tell us the answers to the questions? Okay, cool. So question number one, which company invented the modern, I knew this one actually, the modern computer mouse? And the answer, Xerox. Bill English created a, a ball mouse in 1972 while working for Xerox Park. It came as part of the hardware package of the Xerox Alto computer. This variant of the mouse resembled an inverted trackball and became the predominant form used with personal computers throughout the 1980s and 90s. How about that? I'm sure you guys remember the ball, right? In your mouse? Oh yeah, for sure. If you cool. don't remember well, like that, yeah. you're, you're very, and you're yeah, big time. <laughs> yeah, that's, true. The, that's, that's the cutoff <laughs> point. Question if two? If you didn't have a computer when you grew up, uh, then you're also pre-Gen Z. Yeah, that's a good one. There's a handful of criteria that we always check. Question two, should I move on? Yes. All right. Which designer has a type of door named after themselves? The answer, Don Norman, who coined the term user experience when he worked for Apple in the mid nineties. The Norman door is any door that's confusing or difficult to use, where you can't determine whether you need to push, pull, or slide the door. Don Norman argued that technology should be apparent to use. So when a door is not, is not, it's considered to be a Norman door. I like that. I've never oh, heard yeah. that before. Oh, yeah. If there's this book called, what's it called? I think it's the design of everyday things that it That's might've been, one. he was involved in that. Yeah. And, yeah, and the introduction it. of the book. Yeah. Okay. The introduction of the book is about <laughs> these glass, these beautiful glass doors that are like so stunning to look right. at from the outside and no one that. can figure out how to open them. All right. Question three, here we go. Which browser was the first modern web browser where images could be displayed to users? The answer, Mosaic, which was developed in 1993 at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and co-authored by Mark Andreessen. How about that? Mosaic was instrumental in popularizing the world, World Wide Web by integrating multimedia such as text and graphics into web pages. Well done. Who was the big winner? Adam's gone again. Oh, Adam's definitely not the winner. We'll have to look at the results after the fact, but we'll email all of our participants and let them know if they won their, the $10 Starbucks gift card. Very cool. It's a fun way to end. Cool. Did we, sorry, just checking on time check here. I don't want to take up everyone's additional time. We can Five actually wrap minutes. up Georgia. We've got lots of educational content available. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. In that case, this has been an absolutely great conversation. I think so many early SaaS teams are still trying to figure out how education and success and everything fits in, especially in the new world of product-led growth. All of these things are big and overwhelming and scary and also really accessible and important. And so the more content we can get out there about how to do it right and who's doing interesting things in the space is great. And thank you so much for coming on. If people have follow-up questions, please email me, Georgia at candy.ai to talk about it, or PJ, if, if you're available to be in contact with or have a favorite form of social media, please follow along. But yeah, I think this has been absolutely wonderful content for me and for hopefully Thank you, other PJ. people as well. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Thank, thank you guys for having me. Really appreciate it. Awesome. Yeah. Take care. Sayonara. Thanks.